Today in the Retro Room, we have a package. What's in this package? It's a pair of Tandy 102 portable computers. The first one is a nice Tandy 102 in a gorgeous case with very little yellowing. In contrast to its neighbor, which is something different. What we have here is a very yellowed Paladin MC1. This is a rebadged Tandy 102 sold as the Paladin MC1 Sonic Blueprint Digitizer Measuring System. This appears to be some sort of system for laying down blueprints and calculating distances based on them. It came with a pen and an external interface. But for our purposes today, it's just another 102 and it needs its battery replaced. So let's get inside it and see what we've got. Looking inside the ROM door, we've got a ROM2 Cluso ROM in here. This was a software that contained additional basic development tools, a debugger, renumber utility, things like that. And it's wrapped in a little flexible module that allows it to plug into the Tandy Option ROM socket without being an actual Tandy Option ROM. I'd like to quickly commend Dan, the fellow who sent these to me, for remembering to send these with the battery power switch in the off position. You should always do this whenever you're shipping or storing uh, Model 100, 102, or 200, just to make sure that in case it gets delayed in shipping, you don't want the memory battery to be completely depleted and possibly leak even more. So we're going to give this a quick test. First thing we need to do is turn that memory power switch back on so that we can actually run it. The 100 series will not power up with the memory battery and the switch in the off position. We've got an external power supply here. It's regulated 6 volts. So we'll turn the unit on and it seems to be running just fine. It's a 32K unit and we can see that from the bottom as well. we'll just run a quick uh, basic test here. And there we go. Basic seems to be working just fine. Unfortunately, I'm having a little trouble interrupting the program because the break key is very hard to press. There's something wrong with this. We'll have to look into that. As getting out of basic, we'll go into the text editor and just give the rest of the keyboard a quick try. Yep, all the alpha keys seem to be working. Number keys, though, are doing something weird. The one key seems to immediately arrow over to the left. So something going on with this section of the keyboard. We'll have to get inside and take a look. Back into basic though, let's see if we can run this Clouseau ROM, make sure that socket's working. And indeed, we can see the Clouseau has been initialized. So no problems with the option ROM socket. I think we've got a pretty well functioning machine here. If we can just sort out what's up with this keyboard and get that battery replaced. Just like on the Model 100, opening a Model 102 is as simple as removing the four corner screws and then splitting the case uh, into the top case and bottom case. You kind of want to stand the unit on its edge and then get your thumbnail underneath that top case and sort of run it around the machine in order to disconnect all of the catches that hold the top and bottom cases together. Then with the two halves of the case separated, you can just open it up like a sort of sandwich style. Now on the 102, the keyboard and display PCBs are not f fixed attached to the top case, so they just sort of flop around in there and you'll need to be careful about that. They're also on much more delicate, uh, flexible, flat cables rather than the, the wire bundle cables of the 102, so they're a little bit more susceptible to damage. Now pressing on these problematic buttons, they feel fine right now. So I think what we're actually dealing with is a case assembly problem. These flat flex cables, particularly the one for the LCD, are a little bit difficult to reinstall, so I'm gonna try to avoid disconnecting them if I can. That's why I'm leaving these things sort of flopping around in the wind. And sure enough, that's exactly what we've got. This is a very common mistake when reassembling a Model 102. This machine at one point was disassembled and then reassembled incorrectly. The PC board is supposed to slide into these little plastic catches down here, but instead it's resting on top of them, which 
puts it up too high and puts too much pressure on the top case and that's what was causing the keys to malfunction before and also making it slightly difficult to open because the latch has had a little too much pressure on them. So we'll be correcting that when we put the unit back together. The 102 logic board is only held in place with two screws unlike the Model 100 so removing it from the bottom case is just as simple as removing those two screws and then picking up the logic board. You also don't have to worry about dislodging the battery connectors because the battery holder is attached to the logic board on the 102 unlike the 100 where it's integral to the bottom plastic case. So we'll just stack these PC boards on top of each other and set it face down onto some protective plastic so we can get a look at the component side of the 102 logic board. And we can see that there is some slight corrosion on this memory battery, only on one of the terminals it seems. Hopefully it hasn't done any damage to the logic board. We'll take a closer look and verify that in a minute. Mostly out of my own curiosity, I'm going to remove this ROM2 Clouseau module and take a better look at the flat flex ribbon around it that allows it to interface with the M100 option ROM. It's a little bit difficult to pry out of this socket because there's no extraction ribbon underneath this ROM, so we're just going to have to sort of dig it out with you know, sharp instruments. And here you can see the ROM module. There's little instructions on the bottom that tell you how to orient it in the socket. and I'll try to get it to where you can see this on the camera. The legs of the ROM are actually up against uh, conductive portions of this flat flex that connect it to there. And this flat flex is actually a circuit that remaps the pins from a standard JEDEC ROM to the pinout of the option ROM connector, which of course is non-standard. Thank you so much, Tandy. So getting back to the primary repair job here, we're going to get this old memory battery out and replace it with a new one. I'm going to use just a little bit of my flux pen on the bottom here to spread the heat around. One of the issues with removing the RAM battery on a 102 is this very large ground wire that runs right between the battery terminals, depending on how this is installed, because I think it's done by hand. It could be glued down very close to one of the battery terminals and require you to chip away and break some of this epoxy loose so that you can get the wire out of the way and not melt it with your desoldering iron when you're getting the battery out. I'm using a relatively inexpensive ZD985 desoldering gun set to 330C, which is the temperature I typically run it at. And now we're going to get the desoldering gun in here and just suck all the solder out of these joints. This is kind of a fat trace here, so I'm going to leave the iron on there a little bit longer than I usually would and make sure I get all of the solder out of that joint. And I'll just push this wire to the side with my finger. And just like that, the old memory battery is out. Now unfortunately it does look like some of the corrosion did make it down to the board. So I'm going to get in there with some alcohol on a Q-tip and just clean up this top surface of the board a little bit. Now that the flux and corrosion has been removed, I can actually see what may be trace damage or it may just be contamination of the silk screen. I'll have to get in there later and see if there's actually been any damage to the tracks and anything that has to be repaired. I really hope not because there's a lot of tracks that go through here and this is the system bus connector so it would really be a pain in the butt to have to repair these traces. I also noticed this black mark on the flat flex cable for the keyboard but luckily when I removed and inspected it, it turned out to just be black marker where someone had marked one side of the cable, probably to keep the orientation straight when they reassembled it. So now we'll flip the board over to the other side and again use alcohol on a Q-tip to clean up the flux around the pads here and get these pads ready for the installation of the new battery. You want everything nice and clean so that you have an easy time soldering it. Here you can see a close-up of a little bit of the track damage from the battery corrosion. I got in there with my multimeter and toned out most of these traces and they all seem fine. 
I think this machine got lucky and I got in here to replace the battery basically just in time. It's really important if you own any vintage computers or old electronics that you get inside, make sure all the internal batteries are removed, and be careful not to store it with double A's or anything like that installed because they also will leak and they do a tremendous amount of damage to these old machines. And now it's time to open up our brand new package of replacement memory batteries. I order mine from Jameco, but you can source these online from a number of places. I want to particularly give a shout out to ArcadeShopper.com. He carries a lot of good Model 100 and 102 accessories, including memory batteries, REXs, and RAM modules. What we're installing here is a 3.6 volt, 80 milliamp hour nickel metal hydride cell. Just for safety's sake, we're going to get the meter out and double check the voltage on this battery before we install it. Make sure we're not installing a dud, which we're not, so that's good. Be sure you install the battery with the correct polarity. The plus and minus are noted on the silk screen on the component side of the board. You can see right here there's a plus on the right and a minus side on the left. Insert the battery's tabs into the holes here for the battery. They should fit snugly enough to hold the battery in place as you flip the board over. And I'm going to apply a little bit of MG Chemicals Flux on the bottom of this in order to help the solder wet to it. I sometimes have troubles with these batteries taking the solder properly. And now we'll use some basic 6040 lead based solder to solder this battery terminals in. I'm using the knife tip on my HACO iron here, again at about 320, 330 degrees C. I'm going to use a fair amount of dwell time here to make sure that this solder has time to make its way through the solder via and to overcome any of the heat mass of the large traces and the battery tabs on the other side. You really want to make sure the solder flows properly on this battery. And here's a close-up of the soldered battery terminals. You can see where the solder really only wetted to one side of these battery legs, and I find that to be typical for these Jameco batteries. Maybe some other brand battery is a little bit better, but it does seem to do the trick, so I'm going to leave it like this. And again, we're going to get in with some alcohol on a Q-tip and clean up all that flux that I added. Now that our memory battery is reinstalled, let's do some quick electrical checks on it. The battery voltage itself seems to be good. Now we're going to turn the memory power switch on and check the battery voltage rail. Make sure that we have a good connection between the battery and the power circuit. The memory power rail is marked VB on the silk screen, and it is good. It's reading 3.0 volts versus the 3.4 volts of the battery, and that's normal because this does pass through a diode in order to prevent the 5 volts from getting fed back to the battery improperly. I also went and checked the battery level at the individual RAM chips just to make sure there was no problems with the circuit. And again, this machine looks just fine. Now it's time to reassemble the machine. I did end up disconnecting the flat flex for the LCD in order to get better access to the PC board, so now I have to reinstall it. The cable feeds through this little slot in the board and then needs to get pressed into this connector. Unfortunately, there's not really a good place to get your fingers around it, so what I wind up doing is using pliers. Make sure to grasp where the extra plastic reinforcer is on this cable so you're not grasping the cable directly and then very gently push it into that connector, doing your best to avoid damaging any of those conductors embedded in the flat flex cable. Because if you do that, then you're going to have to repair the flat flex, and that's not fun. The flat flex for the keyboard PCB is much easier to reinstall. Just grasp it by the plastic stiffener and press it up into the connector like normal. Now it's time to reassemble the unit. When you put the logic board down, remember it does go component side down, unlike the Model 100. 
And as I said before, you need to make sure that you get the PCB inserted underneath the plastic catches in the frame, as you can see here. Also make sure that the switches on the board are lined with the plastic switch covers in the bottom case. They're what make the switches accessible from the outside. Lay the LCD module on top of the Logic PCB so that the flat flex cable is not obstructing the screw hole and then reinstall that screw to mount the Logic PCB down to the bottom case. And then move it aside to expose the last remaining screw hole. The two plastic standoffs protruding through the board should also protrude through the black insulator. The two metal support tabs on the LCD module are shown here and they should be slotted into corresponding slots in the Logic PCB and that's what supports that side of the LCD. Before I put the top case on, I'm just going to use a little bit of isopropyl alcohol on a Kim wipe to make sure I've got any grease and dust off of the LCD glass. And then I'm also going to use it on the underside of the plastic cover, again, just to remove any dust and dirt that may have gotten on it while I had it open. The three black plastic support tabs on the keyboard PCB should go into the exposed areas of the PCB there, not resting on top of the black plastic insulator. And that's what supports the keyboard on this unit. There's no bottom support on the keyboard on the Model 102. And now we can snap the top case back on, and hopefully now with the PCB correctly installed, it will snap on correctly and the keys will work normally. And with the cover closed, these keys feel good now, so I think we've corrected the key issue. Unfortunately, I think that the unit has sat for a long time in this configuration, and it's caused the top plastic case to bend, and that bend may have taken permanent set now. There might not be anything we can do about this without trying to reform it under heat. So let's connect some power, uh, turn the memory power switch back on, and we'll give it this unit one final test. The system boots properly and it indicates 32K of RAM still, so that's good. We'll go into basic, make sure we can start up the option ROM, take my number lock off. And unfortunately I forgot to actually reinstall the option ROM, so that's definitely not going to work unless I put this back in. We'll continue testing the rest of the system, just write a quick basic program, make sure basic is running properly. And with the unit reassembled properly, the shift break key combo works perfectly on the first try. That's what we wanted to see. So we'll save the basic program into memory. Exit back to the menu. We can see it in the menu there. And now we're gonna turn off power and disconnect the power supply from it. Test the memory battery. I typically find that with a memory battery not functioning properly you have three or five seconds before the memory gets erased on its own so we'll just let it sit here for 10 or so turn it back on and our program is still in memory and the clock is still ticking so I think we've got a good system now before reinstalling the ROM 2 module I'm actually gonna put an extraction ribbon into this so that the next time anyone has to get this out it'll be a lot easier these are the ribbons that I have already cut for, for shipping with my Rex's and it's the right size so I'm just gonna place it underneath the ROM module there so that it can be used to pull the ROM module out if anyone ever needs it the alignment of these third-party flex ROM modules is a little bit difficult but once you get it right you just press it in there and you should feel it seat pretty well
To remove the ROM module, just grab both ends of the extraction ribbon and pull straight up. So this way, if he ever wants to install a Rex in this unit, he'll have a lot easier time getting this out than I did. The final touch on this is to put a label in here underneath the ROM door indicating the memory battery has been replaced and when. It's always a good idea to label these things when you do any internal maintenance, that way you don't have to open it up to see if the memory battery has been replaced or not. I'll replace the original ROM door which had these lovely little notes on it indicating how to start the option ROM modules. So we'll turn it over and apply one last power to on test. Our basic program is still there. We can go into basic and actually start the option ROM again. And Cluso is loaded. When reinstalling the case screws into a Model 102, because these screws go into plastic threads rather than the threaded inserts in the Model 100, you always need to make sure to turn the screwdriver backwards until you feel the screw drop into the existing threads in the plastic and only then start tightening and it should tighten very easily. You should definitely not feel like you're having to force it through plastic. This is important to avoid cutting new threads on top of the old plastic threads. And there we have it, completed battery replacement on a Tandy Model 102.